I seem to be getting on really well with the kids that nobody else wanted to teach or nobody else could reach. You know, I seem to get on very well with the rougher end of the scale, shall we say. And so I, I started putting down everything that I'd learned and that worked into a kind of a little manual for myself. Because how do I get them quiet? Like, how do I stop them talking? How do I stop them interrupting me? And it was like, okay, obviously that is the thing. So that's what I went with. I have your book too. Honestly, man, I have learned so, so, so much from your stuff. Your podcast is the only one I listen to. I am so grateful to self-publishing because I knew that a passive income would get us through. Hey, Chandler Volt here, and joining me today is Rob Plevin. Uh, Rob is an ex-teacher, trainer, and behavior consultant uh, with over 3 million views on YouTube. Uh, his first book was traditionally published, uh, but despite apparently being one of the biggest books at that publishing company, one of the bestsellers, the royalty payments weren't great. They would come every six months. And so after two years, he decided to buy back the rights to his book, plan to self-publish and did self-publish. Uh, and he expected to have, it's kind of funny, he expected to have like, hey, three to four years, maybe we have a, a, a ret ROI return on investment for this book, but it paid for itself in less than six months. And six years later, still generates $80,000 a year, six years after it was published, which is pretty incredible. I'm super excited for this uh, episode. Teachers, educators, professors, uh, listen up. You're going to love this episode. And it was fun right before we got started. Uh, Rob mentioned listening to this podcast as part of his journey. And then we were trying to figure out, we know we've worked together in some capacity, whether it was our Somewhere Books program or uh, Author Advantage Live or something. <laughs> uh, we couldn't figure it out, but uh, it's apparently we've been a part of his journey over the years. And so it's fun to have it full circle. And hopefully for a lot of you listening to this or watching this, it's that thing that we always talk about. It's two steps ahead of you, right? That person who's, okay, this is you maybe from a few years ago or I guess Rob was you a few, a few years ago. So it's just like, that's what I want you to really grab onto in this episode is, is figuring out like, hey, what are these key takeaways from a few years into the future? So Rob, really, really fun to have you here. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much. I am so pleased to be here, Chandler. Thank you so much. So uh, take us back to the beginning. Obviously, your first book went on to become an international bestseller. Um, what motivated you to write the first book about your experiences as an educator? Okay, so um, going back right to the start, really, uh, I, I was teaching and I seemed to be getting on really well with the kids that nobody else wanted to teach or nobody else could, could reach. You know, I seemed to get on very well with the, the, the rougher end of the, the scale, shall we say. And so I, I started putting down everything that I'd learned and that worked into a kind of a little manual for myself. And then I, I threw a website together. I'm not very technical at all, so that was a huge hurdle for me. But I put this website together and I put it out as an ebook. And um, it, it really was quite, quite basic, to be honest. But quite a few people bought it. And, and a lady in Singapore bought it and invited me over to do um, some training. So uh, by that time, I was actually on a break from teaching. So I went out and I was out there for uh, five days teaching, I think it was about 500 teachers. Uh, the basics of, of classroom management, behavior management. And that went down so well that I came back and I thought, you know what, I'd, I'd really like to do this. So I, I set up a training company and one, when I'd set that up, um, I basically had one course that I could teach and it, it quickly became apparent that if you actually want to survive in business, you need quite a few products to sell or you certainly need to be selling one product a lot. And I wasn't doing so I came up with this amazing idea of asking my customers what they wanted to know what the biggest <laughs> problem was <laughs> it's like marketing 101 um, and lo and behold the main thing that they wanted to know was how to keep control of a noisy class mm. so I put together this program uh, did it as a, a little web class and we sold loads and loads and loads and then I, I was approached by um, a publishing company to put that together as a book so I, I basically took the transcript of the web class put it into book format and then we went through a, a very lengthy uh, editor process and, and turned that into into the book that it was before I bought it back. So it was published mm. for about two years. Mm. Got it. Okay. So you said, if I'm hearing correctly, it sounds like, all right, I've got these things that I'm learning from being a teacher, being an educator, kind of distilling those things. All right, let's turn this into an ebook. Let's start selling that. All right, it starts to sell. That leads to the first kind of real world teaching engagement, which I love that. It's kind of full circle. 
uh, it, where I think a lot of times authors, if you don't have experience in the real world with what you're teaching, the feedback loops can be tough, right? Because you write it, publish it, and wait for the Amazon reviews. And by that time, it's kind of too late, right? So I love that, that it was, all right, you're out in the wild actually teaching this stuff. And then now it, it, kind of distilling that and, and saying, this is so funny, Rob. I think a big lesson for people listening or watching this is what's the thing that people are already asking you about? <laughs> Uh, and cause that, it sounds like that's what you discovered is everyone saying, Hey, hey, hold up. What about the noisy class thing though? Like, can you help me with a noisy class? And so how did you kind of dis how did you, I'm sure there were multiple things that people were asking. How did you kind of narrow in on that and decide that that was the topic of the first book? So initially what I did was I, I, I just started creating loads and loads of little eBooks, um, on different facets, kind of micro areas of the big picture. You know, how do you, how do you take control of a class? How do you get them interested in lessons and that kind of thing? So I came up with loads of little tiny topics and I turned those into eBooks, but it really didn't seem to be hitting exactly what, what they wanted. I, I just felt there was a disconnect somehow. So I ran this survey and basically just said, what is your biggest problem? Uh, I used a uh, survey monkey and the, the question that, or the, the answer that came up again and again and again was how do I get them quiet? Like, how do I stop them talking? How do I stop them interrupting me? And it was like, okay, obviously that is the thing. So that's what I, what I went with. That's cool. And so we're, we, we talk about this in, in my book published. I talk about, um, forget what page this is, but the four P's of a best-selling book, right? Person, pain, promise, price, page 58. Person, pain, promise, price, right? And so you had a person, teachers, educators, and then pain, what's the pain that they have that they know that they have? And then the compelling promise that you can make with the book, which is, you know, quite well done. And just the title is take control of the noisy class. <laughs> uh, what is it? Uh, chaos to calm in 15 seconds. I mean, that's a, a great promise and tying that all in there um, as, as part of the hook of the book. So you distill that, you traditionally publish it, you go through that process. It was traditionally published for two years. Obviously the, the royalty checks weren't great. So you decided to buy back the rights. Two part question on that. One, why do you think the royalty checks were so low and why was the traditionally published route just not what you thought it would be? And then um, how, really, how'd you buy back the rights? Cause that's pretty tough to do. Okay, yeah, good questions. Uh, but first of all, I have your book too. <laughs> oh, look at that. And, look at that. Um, all right, we got, we'll, we'll get a screenshot in post-production. <laughs> all right, love it. That's awesome. So I, I got the first uh, edition of this and I've got the second edition. That, I mean, honestly, man, I have learned so, so, so much from your stuff, not just um, the things that you teach, but obviously the people that you get on. Uh, and I, I mentioned this just before we went live, you know, your podcast is the only one I listen to. Uh, the, the quality of the people who come on here and teach their, their methodologies. I've learned so much more from those and your materials than I have from lots of uh, very mm. heftily priced programs. But the reason I'm putting that out is because I used the format that you just mentioned there, that, that mm. four part process mm -hmm. uh, to systemize uh, the content. So I'm very big on, on having things easy to, to digest. But getting back to your questions, um, so the, the royalty payments weren't the only reason that I, I came away from that, that model, that traditionally published model. But what I found was um, it was a brutal editorial process, you know, going through several revisions of, of editors and also changing the book from what it was. And, and they tried to take my voice out, which, you know, I, I had quite a few... Uh, little jokes in they were a bit risky and, and they were like we can't have that and i'm like well it needs to be in there they weren't much mm -hmm. you know it's just pushing it a little bit mm -hmm. so they wanted to change it a lot having said that i am so grateful to going through that process because now that i self-publish i'm aware of just how uh detail orientated you need to be so i i have a really good editor and we make sure that we go to a professional standard if i hadn't been through that with traditional publishers me being me i know point. it would be a shoddy um product that was out there mm -hmm. so i know that detail is needed um so it was a tough process it took about 18 months and at the end of it i was so thrilled i was like over the moon i've got a book and i'm published i'm a published author and royalties were dismal you know we basically went out for a pizza every six months on the royalties <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was crummy it was crummy and um, I, I thought, well, you know, this is no good. My parents had, had just died and um, I was left some money. And I thought, you know, I need to do something with this money. So about mm. two and a half years after we'd been published, 
I thought uh, putting the money into that is a pretty good business investment. You know, I, I, it'll be mine. I keep it. And if I get the money back in, in three years, then that, you know, that's pretty solid. Uh, so I approached the publisher and I said, can I buy the rights back? And at first they were like, well, no, you know, you, you can't. It's going to be a really hefty price tag because it's one of our best sellers. Uh, and then I said, well, what's your price? And then I actually got them to drop it a bit as well. Mm. Um, just by saying, look, we can go now. So they did drop it a bit. My publishers were excellent. I have a really good relationship with them still. Um, they were, they were really, really good. And one of the things that they said was right along all along was that I kept the internet uh, intellectual property rights. So they didn't take copyright. So that was always a good thing. Oh, wow. Anyway, I got the rights back and, uh, yeah, um, went into a, a, a pretty hefty self-publishing process where I brought an editor on to rework it a little bit. I brought a really good designer on really good formatting team. And we went for a professional standard mm. um, and it cost quite a bit to put that together, but I'm, I'm so glad I did, you know, it was, mm -hmm. it was a good, to, good return. Mm -hmm. Cool. And it also and got me then into self-publishing right right and then obviously you've self-published multiple books successfully since then and just to clarify this was the take control of a noisy class book Yes, yes, that, that was the, cool. well, I, I actually had self-published a couple of my other eBooks beforehand, mm -hmm. but we didn't get results. And mm. I, I was like, shall I really do this? You know, is it mm -hmm. worth doing? We were seeing a little bit of a result from putting some marketing in that I'd done to sell courses in the past. Mm -hmm. um, enough for me to say, right, I'm going to give it a go. Uh, but what I did realize and what I've realized since then, which we'll probably talk about when we come to marketing, is that one of the things the publishers really were heavy on was me doing the marketing. And I thought, well, hang on, I, I don't want to do all this work and get nothing in return. Yeah. But they kept saying, look, you've got an interview with this magazine. Please mm -hmm. write an article for this magazine. So for a few months, I was, I was a content machine just creating content for them. I mean, you've heard of AI and ChatGPT. Well, I was ChatGPT on steroids back then. I mean, I created far more content than ChatGPT. I did loads. <laughs> <laughs> I'm burnt out now. I don't do so much. But we got Rob GPT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Rob GPT. That was me. <laughs> and um, all those links, obviously, on those magazines and blog sites and things were linking to the book even after we self-published. So it did create quite a bit of marketing for us. What do you think was the difference between the early books that you self-published and you, you know, republishing this traditionally published book. And, and obviously that's went well and sold well versus you said, Hey, the first couple that you did, you're like, Hey, this didn't really do super well. Um, is this even worth doing? What do you think was the main difference? Or differences. Okay, so um, on my website, there's a there's a, a free document that's got basically all the strategies I've used to do the marketing, and in there, there's a picture of uh, one of the books, um, the two covers, basically the original cover versus a new cover with a proper design team. Mm. All my books had terrible covers; mm -hmm. uh, they were really badly formatted. I I didn't do really very much marketing at all. There were no backlinks, you know, in terms of articles going out and things. I didn't put anywhere near the effort in terms of quality or marketing behind them. Because remember this one, I invested my inheritance from my parents. So I thought, I, I, I can't risk this. I've got to go all in. So a lot more went into noisy class than the others. Got it. Okay. So a lot, a lot more going into the production, the marketing, and it sounds like a better cover. Um, and you kind of touched on something earlier that you didn't explicitly say it, but it kind of is very in line with, with what we believe, which is your self-published book shouldn't look self-published, right? And Absolutely. how going through the traditional publishing process, one of the, seems like one of the bright spots is that you learn the standard. And then now you can make sure that you replicate the standard when you're self-publishing your books, which I think is really, really helpful. Talk to me about, I want to go back into that kind of that moment of, all right, you bought back the rights and then just logistically for people who aren't, you know, familiar with this, I would assume that what probably happened is that the book had to get taken down from Amazon and all the re reviews removed and everything. And then you had to relaunch it, but self-publish like with a new ISBN and all that stuff, and then kind of start from scratch and do a full relaunch. Is that, is that what happened or was it different than that? Yeah, pretty, pretty much. Um, I mean, I got in touch with Amazon and again, my publishers were so good in terms of a seamless changeover, you know, they, they did everything they could to help. I got in touch with Amazon and made sure that the original reviews would carry over. So they would Oh, wow. That's books. great. That's really great. Yeah, they, they linked the two books. We did a new ISBN, obviously, because it's a new, new edition. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what else? Sorry, what can you just mention the question again? Sorry. I no, that's that's good. Um, so so you were able to transfer the reviews. You've got a new S ISBN is probably uh, uh, a, a similar um, you got yeah, a, a similar listing. Yeah, yeah. Similar listing. Sorry, um, I'm mind blank. Uh, so I, that makes sense as part of that process. Can you talk to us about maybe the relaunch? How did you do that? This is something that I know we beat the drum of the relaunch of like, hey, everyone should relaunch your book, no matter where you're at in the process. Um, but can you talk to me yeah. about how did you relaunch the new version? What did you put into that? Any lessons learned there? 
Yeah, and, and I mentioned actually one thing I've learned from you on, on a couple of the podcasts is you've mentioned re relaunching. Um, I'm due for a, a, an anniversary relaunch on this one, so mm. I'm going to relaunch mm -hmm. it again because it cool. is starting to need a little bit of a revamp. And I'll just go back one quick step as well, which was another reason why I moved away from uh, the publishers was I couldn't change any of the, the, the back end data. I couldn't change the listing. I couldn't mess around with the pricing, nothing, you know, so that, that was very restrictive. So one of the first things we did was, was rewrite the, the listing. And I, I, I was very keyword heavy and within a very short period actually of rewriting that, that listing, we started to rank for the keyword classroom management. So uh, there was a lot in terms of cool. back end stuff, but then mm -hmm. for the launch, um, first of all, I got a load of, uh, experts and fellow, well, the competition, basically, I got a load of people that I'd done some speaking with, uh, a lot of other teacher authors and trainers. I think I had about 20 involved. And what I said to them was, look, uh, we're all in the same market. Some of them I knew, some I didn't. I said, we're all in the same market. Uh, I've got a list of teachers. I can get you some exposure to them. Will you um, contribute some bonuses to this book that I'm putting out? And in return, we'll all promote at the same time. And then we'll all get a bit of exposure. So I created two lots of bonuses. I created um, a big bonus suite of resources myself that go along with the book. So that gave me a chance to advertise those and say, look, if you buy this book, you get all these bonuses. But then I had a secret bonus suite on my website and I gamified it a little bit. You know, I said, there's a, the, the third word on page 42 or whatever it was, I can't remember. I said, if you put that in this box, you'll get the secret bonuses and they're worth 500 pounds or whatever from all these different trainers. Mm -hmm. And all those other trainers not only gave me a review, an advanced review, um, which looked good, you know, because some of them are pretty slick. Some of them are quite mm -hmm. big names, but mm -hmm. they also helped promote the book. So that gave us a kick. Right. I had a really good launch team behind it and, and one mm -hmm. or two other things um, which we can, we can get to. Cool. And so I hope you're loving this episode so far. So if you're serious about writing and publishing your book, we would love to chat with you and help create a custom plan. All right. So all you need to do right now is go to selfpublishing.com forward slash schedule, schedule a 45 minute consultation with one of the experts on my team. All right. Let's implement what you're learning in this episode and let's see how we can help with your book. Go to selfpublishing.com forward slash schedule. Yeah. Let's, let's dive into more of the marketing. Um, so, uh, so it sounds like, you know, updating the listing, doing a proper re relaunch, like your descriptions, getting the book to rank, like now that you've got the control of that self publishing, getting editorial reviews from people who are needle movers, having a launch team, those were kind of the core components. It sounds like of, of the relaunch itself, it, it, looking back, obviously if the book is continues to sell well and has sold well for years. Why do you think it's continued to sell well for so long? And what are maybe the top two or three things that you feel like have moved books? over the years yeah uh it ha it has continued to sell well i think a lot of it is is um there's so many links going to it from different articles mm. um and the the really heavy push that i gave it that continued you know you always talk about this this long-term launch mm -hmm. and that's so important you know I, I invested so much in this that it had to work so i've put quite a lot in in terms of making sure it goes so i'm always looking at different strategies i'm always listening to a certain podcast called selfpublishing.com to get new ideas um, but a few of the things that have worked. So uh, one, it's a good book. So you get the, the word of mouth. And I think with teachers, uh, you know, you, you've got a, an advantage in that they go in the staff room and they share things, you know, so, so there's, there's the, the word of mouth is, is pretty easy there. In terms of the launch, initially, I had, I, I still have a really good launch team. So whenever I launch a book, we, we utilize this launch team. I'm forever uh, adding new members to it and I'm forever cleaning it. So if, if people aren't pulling their weight or don't want to be involved, they're out. So we have a steady group of about 300 people. And for them, I involved them in the creation of the book. So they were oh, involved cool. in, they took part in some of the editing, you know, they, they were mm -hmm. my proofreaders. So it's like free editing, free proofreading. Mm -hmm. um, they gave feedback. They told me what else they would like in it. They gave contributions to the cover and, and, and everything else, the description. So that was one thing they were invested in it. Mm -hmm. um, I then had them submit a review to the group so that everybody could see the type of reviews that were coming through. And that kind oh, of motivated cool. others to take part. Yeah. Uh, then I had them come up with the best idea for promotion. So there was a prize for whoever comes up with the most ingenious way to shift a few copies. That was all in the group. And mm -hmm. then we moved to the next stage, which was putting it out there, getting your review on Amazon and then promoting. So that was the launch team. Um, I had obviously the, the contributors and the, the influencers and the, the, uh, the bloggers and the people who were involved in 
in mm -hmm. sending me resources. They all, they all helped. Then we, we hit on reviews. Um, initially, the reviews came from my network and, and my launch team and those contributors. Um, and then I used NetGalley. I don't know if you're familiar with NetGalley. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Of course you're familiar with NetGalley. You didn't ask that. <laughs> So I was in NetGalley for quite a while, but it worked out a bit expensive, so I, I, I didn't stay in it too long. Mm -hmm. um, I used the Facebook group method, so I went into Facebook groups and said, look, I've got this new book. Would you like a free copy in return for a review? And then a new method, which um, we're just using quite recently uh, in terms of reviews, is a study group. I was actually approached by a, a district in the States who placed an order for, I think, about 300 books. And they got in touch with me. In actual fact, I'm running the study group tonight. They got in touch and said, uh, will you do a, a free study group for these 300 teachers who've got your book? You know? And I'm like, I don't know. She said, it could be 300 reviews. I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. Of course I'll do it. Oh, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that, that's like a really cool set of reviews there and there. So I'm going to go online, answer a few questions for half an hour, and then hopefully help them with, with their problems, and we'll get some reviews. In terms of the ongoing marketing, um, I've used giveaways on King Sumo. I've used uh, guest posting, which I think was brilliantly explained in episode 82 of Self Publishing School podcast by Susie Moore. I'm not even going to try. Oh and yeah, man! Look at you. You got the you got <laughs> the the cross references. The cross like that was a great episode. Susie super really smart. Was. It really was. In fact, here's another one. Jonathan Green's episode on on. Um, uh, chat GPT when he was mentioning having a page in the back of your book if you find a typo get in touch and let us know yep. how many uh, one star reviews are you going to avoid with that so mm -hmm. yes I, I, I digress uh, another message which has worked really good is sharing expert excerpts of the book on social media so if we the book's filled with little strategies and little games and activities and things so what we do is we we just clip one of those watermark it a little bit and we say look here's a really cool activity if you're wanting to get kids to do xyz uh, mm. if you'd like to know more here's the link to the book I've done a lot of email swaps with other authors in the teaching space oh that's smart um, yeah and, and that works really well actually mm -hmm. um we we push for bulk orders from, from schools and we offer bonuses for multiple copies. So mm -hmm. if somebody buys one copy, they get one of our courses free. If they buy mm -hmm. three copies or five copies, they get a big bundle of stuff. And it, mm. it, you know, it really doesn't cost us anything because these are back-end resources. But I find that particularly during a launch, actually, that works really well to shift multiple copies. Um, now, the, I'll, I'll mention this about my email list because before I used to do this, my email open rate went down to about 8%. Um, and then what I started doing was almost gamifying my email series. So when somebody signs up on the back of the book now, there's a message that says, um, or on the back of several other things, the message kind of says, look, welcome to us. Uh, really hope you enjoy it here. Really hope you're enjoying the book, et cetera, et cetera. You'll find that we like to give a lot of stuff for free, but you've got to look for it. So I kind of hide the free resources on the website. Sometimes they've got to answer a question. Sometimes they've got to look for a little code. There's, there's often we, get, we give a resource for free, but we don't just give a link in the email. We make them work for it. And I think that has contributed to a lot more engagement with our emails because they're looking for stuff now rather than just, oh, it's another email, you know? And, and that That's has cool. definitely helped increase open rate and engagement. That's cool. Man, it's really, really impressive. There's so many things to highlight there and so many follow-up questions I, I could ask. I, I think the prompt that I would give is if you're watching this, listening to this right now, reverse the tape five minutes and listen to that again. <laughs> Sorry, I did uh, No, no, it was great. No, it was great. Just because there's there's so many things that you, you taught about community building and the launch team concept and using the community to build engagement sell books, get reviews, et cetera. Do you, is that a Facebook community that you run or where yes, does that it, community it, live? Yeah. And I'm not a big fan. I must admit, I'm not good on social media. I have a, uh, an assistant who does all that for me, but mm -hmm. um, I am thinking of moving to something like circle, I think, but yes, it is Facebook at the moment. Got it. Cool. So you've got the community element. You talked about going into Facebook groups and Hey, review swaps of, Hey, I'll give you a free book in exchange for a review. You talked about uh, bundles and deals and King Sumo deal. You talked about <clears throat> cross reference emails for um, like other educators and stuff. You, you talked about gamifying it and making it fun and shareable. I, I want to follow up on the, it, it, like, is there anything that you do to increase the virality or like the shareable component from teacher to teacher, like anything that you embed in the book or prompts or just anything you do around that? 
Um, I, I'm sure there is, but I can't think of anything off, off the top of my head. I mean, we, we used to have a, we used to have a, a subscription program as a back end product. We're just relaunching it actually at the moment, but it used to be uh, very Dan Kennedy esque. You know, there was the thud factor. They got a, a parcel through the post when they first signed up um, and it was filled with all these fantastic resources and two mm. or three DVDs and all this. And I think the fact that we, we engaged with them by sending stuff through the mail um, made a big difference. I also ran uh, a, a regular webinar every week where people could come on and ask questions. Like a, a, um, there was a, a community element there. But what I found was, unfortunately, this is no disrespect to teachers and educators because they do one of the most amazing jobs on the planet. Um, by the way, they've been indoctrinated and by the way they are treated and just because of the way wages are set, teachers tend to not have too much disposable income or they think they haven't got disposable income. They're actually quite well paid now. But it means that we were giving everything away for about $7 a month and you can't send mm. an awful lot out for $7 yeah. a month. Yeah, so oh, I wound sure. that up. Mm -hmm. Got it. That makes sense. And um, you talked about bulk book buys. You talked about encouraging bundling, like just so many sharp, smart things in there. And you talk, I was going to ask you about reviews because obviously, you know, one of your books has over 1300 reviews at the time of recording this and many of the other books have hundreds of reviews. So you, you kind of alluded to some of the ways that you do that. Um, well, I'll ask one question and then I'll follow up on any other tips for getting more reviews. Do you ever do the, um, the short link review thing? So it's like, oh, publishedbook.com forward slash review. And then that just forwards to the Amazon review slot. Have you ever tried that? No, I haven't. And I've heard you talk about it in a, on a few podcasts in the past. Um, no, I haven't. I've kind of just relied on the fact that we seem to get a lot of reviews and I think what that comes down to is with this particular book anyway it, it's a good book and it gets talked about and people are part of it but we have a really supportive ecosystem around it you know mm -hmm. there's, there's a mm -hmm. lot of support a lot of free resources I, I think it's it's an element of over delivering so when right. they get that book there's a hell of a lot of stuff that they're not expecting and there's backup and mm -hmm. there's support you know, and I think it's mm. like, wow, this is this was a book, but I've got so much for it. So I, I think they feel compelled almost to leave a review anyway. But I do like the idea of the short link. Cool. Yeah, it, it's oh I'll, I'll, yeah, there like a couple thoughts there. Like one thing for for uh, listeners, people watching, like two, well, I guess two things that we recommend. One is a short link. So if you're not familiar with that concept, I'll just briefly explain it. It's you know you got a URL on your site. So for me, it's publishedbook.com forward slash review. So take whatever your URL is forward slash review. And then there's a redirect, which you can do this on the back end of WordPress or wherever else, where when someone goes to that site, uh, it redirects them to your Amazon review page. So oftentimes we will ask someone to leave a review, but we don't think like, hey, we're authors. We're on Amazon all the time. We know all this stuff. But for them, it's like, okay, well, I've got to find the book. Then where do you leave reviews? I got to go to that place. I got to kind of got to hunt for it. Like all these, there's really all kind of these impediments. And so whenever you, it's like 101 of direct response, right? Whenever you ask someone to do something, always always make it as easy as possible for them to do the thing. So I'm a big fan of anytime someone says something good about the book, hey, thank you so much. Can you copy and paste that here? But oftentimes you're on your phone or wherever else. So it's like, what's the easy URL that you can remember and use? Um, and then how do you make it as easy as possible for the person doing it? So I'm explaining it like I'm explaining it to a five-year-old, Rob. I know you probably know a lot of this stuff, um, but just so that everyone understands like what it is, how to use it. And then one thing that I do, I know most people were probably listening and not watching, but in the back page is we have what we would call a review plea page. So it says, hey, thanks for reading the book. Like reviews are the lifeblood of uh of, of four authors so can you leave a review and then there's a link the same exact link that makes it super easy which we've got we've got a template on our website like a book outline template that if people want that review page you can download the book outline template and it's in there and that sort of thing but those are two things that we've we've found successful for maximizing reviews anything else that which, oh, by the way, you know, you said you've got that study group tonight. I, I, I would have an easy link for them at the end of that. Or it's, hey, if you, uh, 300 teachers that have the book, if you like the book, leave a review. Here's the link. Yeah, Anything absolutely. else that you've seen work well, Rob, for getting reviews specifically? 
Uh, well, it used to be the Facebook group method, you know, and, and, and hustling. That used to be the big thing that, that worked so well. I think people are just so, um, well, I, th I think Facebook and social media in general is just getting a little bit uh, a bit too much right now, my take on it anyway. But certainly a lot of the people, the authors that I speak to, you know, they're just like, well, that method isn't working anymore. I think it depends on what your topic is and which groups you go into. But um, one that I, I feel is perhaps overlooked is competitors you know people who know what the process is and how difficult it is to put a book together and appreciate what you're going through and what you've gone through um, and to approach them and say look you know I've written a book it I really appreciate what you've done in your book. Would you mind giving me a review? I think that, that's a, a kind of hidden source that we perhaps mm. often overlook. Got it. That's great. Net um, Galley, well, actually, um, just, just following up with that, mm -hmm. Net Galley was, um, although it was expensive, I did get quite a lot of reviews through Net Galley during the time I was there. Cool. Cool. That's good to know. Um, that's it's good to know that that worked for you as a resource. A um, couple kind of a uh, couple final questions, uh, and then we'll wrap up. I I, I would love to hear about um, what's your advice for teachers or educators who are thinking about distilling some of the stuff that they've taught into the classroom uh, into a book. What would be your tips um, there? Um, that, that is a great question, and my my initial gut reaction is don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll explain. Um, I've been doing this, uh, well, close to 20 years, actually, when I put, put my first stuff out and started doing stuff with teachers in terms of selling resources and training. Um, and it's, it's the issue of picking your market. You know, if I did, like I say, I was a content machine a few years back. And if I was in another market uh, that had more money and I was doing this specifically for money, I would make far more money. If it's just money that you're going for, it's a bad marketplace. And a lot of people, when they're trying to set up a business, money is a big part of that. You know, you need to make an income. If it's purely for the passion of helping, then follow your heart, you know, and, that, and that's fine. But a lot of people burn out in this market. And I burned out for, for about five years, actually. I'll, I'll, I'll mention that a little bit more in a moment. But um, my advice would be to very carefully pick the right topic. There are certain things that people desperately need. You know, it's like a, a bleeding neck problem. You know, they desperately need help with it. But um, there are other topics that we're perhaps more passionate about. And we think, oh, this will be a really good thing to write about. And we put our heart and soul into it. And lo and behold, it's crickets. It doesn't sell. So I, I actually burned out for about five years. I, um, I was this content machine. And then my wife and I went through a, a, a pretty hefty accident. Well, I say accident. It was a very traumatic incident. We were um, almost killed in a knife attack. And during that period, I got PTSD. Um, I was exhausted. I got chronic fatigue and I couldn't work for about, uh, about five years properly. And so this is the reason why I am so grateful to self-publishing because I knew that a, a passive income would get us through. And so what I did was I shifted everything mm. into a subscription format. Mm. And then from there, I was like, what can we do that's passive? And it was like, write books, you know, we've got to get books out. So I think definitely go for it, you know, because the passive nature of this, it can be life changing, but you've got to pick your topic really, really well. That's great. I love that. Uh, well, I want to ask a couple final questions and then we'll wrap. The first one, we've got uh, a little live listener Q and A, well, I guess maybe not technically live, uh, but I'm asking the question live. So this is actually our first time ever doing this, Rob. This is fun. Um, so we've got a question from Anna, uh, listener, um, says, uh, as a new writer trying to get published, marketing yourself can be challenging. Uh, any tips for aspiring authors listening on how to break through when it comes to marketing uh, your books? So is that for getting a traditional deal or, or marketing yourself as a self-published? Um, e either, I think either way, yeah. Okay, so um, I think it comes down to relationships, you know, who you get on with, who you, who you know. I would say that to me is the number one first bit and you've really got to be, well, I, when I got my traditional deal, I actually went round in person to the publishers. You know, I, I actually drove down to the to the to the publishing house and I went and I met them in person. I took all the materials and I took all my background and everything else and I met them in person. And some of the very best connections I've made in terms of getting help from people have either been as a result of events that I've been speaking at or events that I've gone to purposefully to meet people mm. who have got connections. Because mm -hmm. when, you, when you're connected then it's, and you've got the right message, then you've got a way of getting that message out. So mm -hmm. I, I think connection would be the first thing I would focus on. That's good. And get in the room with people who have been where you want to go. 
<laughs> which I think is kind of what you're saying there is, okay, who's done what it's the who, not how method, right? Who has done what you want to do? Okay. Get in the room with them and ask them questions. And I feel like my evolution as an author and a business owner is just that repeated thousands of times. <laughs> All right. I got this big problem in my life or in my business. Who solved that before? How do I get in touch with them? And then I've got 30 questions and I'm going to ask when I do, uh, and just repeating that over and over and over again. So that's great guys. Um, we're going to test this out in the next few weeks. So if you have a question that you want me to ask live to one of our future, uh, podcast guests, um, just do one of two things. Um, comment on one of our podcast episodes on the YouTube channel or leave a review uh, with your question in it uh, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever. Um, and so do that, submit those questions if you want to uh, want me to ask those questions uh, in the future uh, for a future episode. Uh, so parting question for, well, I guess kind of two-parter, Rob, for you is the first one would be like, what's your parting piece of advice for the Rob from years ago before you wrote your first, you probably heard me ask this question a bunch of times <laughs> uh, since you listened to the podcast for a while now, but what, what's that parting piece of advice for the Rob that's thinking about writing that first book, maybe as a teacher, as an educator, or just like, you know, at that at, kind of at the starting line, what would you say knowing what you know now besides don't you do know, it? <laughs> yeah. I, I've thought long and hard about this. Um, as I've been driving around since we agreed to do this. And the word that springs to mind is balance um, because I've worked myself into almost an early grave through just focusing on one thing, trying to get money and trying to make the business work. And if you go back to episode 117 with Garrett J. White, <laughs> which was one of, the, uh, one, of, one of the brilliant podcasts I've listened to with you, um, Garrett is just amazing. In his program, he talks about the core four body balance being and business and i think if you're putting your efforts and your time into those four areas so connection with yourself spirituality connection with your relationships and significant other people your health diet and exercise and then looking at marketing and business and content and those sorts of things then you've got a a, a chance of getting a lot further because i like i say i almost brought it to an early demise with uh, mm. just overwork so mm. balance would be my keyword. That's great. That's really great. Well, Rob, where can people go to buy your books to find out more about what you're up to or wherever would be most helpful? Where can they go? Uh, so um, on my main publishing site, it's uh, www.liferaftmedia. That's all one word, liferaftmedia.com. And then forward slash, again, all one word, cheat sheet. C-H-E-A-T-S-H-E-E-T. -E -E and that'll give you kind of a rundown of what I've done in terms of the books. But you can also see on there, we've got a few different brands. Um, we teach meditation, my wife and I, and there's our teaching brand as well. Where we do all the classroom management stuff. So yeah, everything's there really, liferaftmedia.com. Liferaftmedia.com. Love it. Rob, this was incredible. Really, I, I, re I really appreciate how much prep you did for the interview and, and, and just listen to this podcast bringing the goods teaching on this podcast it's been really really fun so thank you for being here oh well thank you Chandler. and I'm, i mean it from the heart man what you're doing um it's important it, it has given me so much hope and inspiration and a, and a compassionate kick up the backside to really keep going so I, I am super grateful for what you do man thank you well thank you rob guys i hope that you love this episode um, of the podcast for future episodes they drop every wednesday make sure that you're subscribed so you don't miss it as always you can listen on spotify apple Podcasts. you can watch on the youtube channel uh, and if you need our help with your book book a call with the team at selfpublishing.com forward slash apply and we will see you next time thank you so much for watching or listening to this episode of the self publishing school podcast i know there's so many places that you could be spending your time there's other podcasts that you could be listening to youtube channels that you'd be watching so thank you so much it means the world now i want you to do three things right now if you found this episode helpful I don't know if you know this, but we've got a YouTube channel. It's a companion channel to this podcast. All the video versions of the episode are on the YouTube channel. So number one, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Number two, if you're listening to this podcast, wherever, whether this is Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Number two, I want you to subscribe to this podcast right now so you don't miss a future episode. And then number three, this is probably the most important, leave a review on the podcast. All right, reviews are super important and help this podcast get discovered by other people. So number three, leave a review on the podcast. Thank you so much. I'll see you in the next episode.